Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're at Randy Reed's house. So you guys might remember Randy. He's been on my channel. It's been a couple of years ago now, maybe when he was down visiting. Um, he, we also did a couple podcasts. So you might know the Aquarius podcast and Randy is the owner and host of the Aquarius podcast, which I was on a couple of times. But also, Randy's a director of operations for Aquarium Co-op, which is probably where a lot of you have heard his name when Corey's talking about testing products and having to not show you guys what's going on. <laughs> it's Randy. So by this time, you guys know that I am now working with Aquarium Co-op. So Yay! we're uh, kind of pseudo uh, colleagues, uh, so to speak. Um, so anyway, we're up here in Washington and wanted to just visit and kind of tour around Randy's fish room because I know he was building this a couple of years ago, was very excited to hear what his plans were. And now I'm up visiting, so we want to check out and see what he's got going on. All right, so we are uh, going to uh, tour around Randy's fish room. So this is actually a fish room that we um, you built in the garage. Yep. So tell us a little bit about uh, kind of the idea about building the fish room, what you wanted to do, and kind of how you went about it. Yeah, I think uh, kind of the natural progression of you get into the hobby, um, you get severely stricken with multiple tank syndrome, you yep. start populating tanks throughout your house, um, maybe you concentrate them in one of the bedrooms, but at some point you have just too many uh, for any room or anywhere in the house. And at some point your significant other, your spouse, whatever it is, kind of kicks all your tanks out and you need to put them somewhere. Right. So we then go to a basement or you build out a room in your garage or you do a shed, whatever it is, you end up like having this dedicated fish room space. And so that's what I have here in my garage. Um, initially had to move some things around to position and clear out a spot, a good spot in the garage for the fish room. Uh, things to consider are like access to electrical and water. I was pretty lucky that on the other side of this wall, which is my downstairs of my house, very easy access to water and electricity. So it kind of made this particular part, which means nothing to you on video right now, but this, this area where the fish room is, um, was kind of like ordained, right? Because um, it was just meant to be because of the, lo the location of the electrical box and uh, water for me to tap into. Uh, from there, I mean, this is a, uh, you know, how to put up two different walls to, to frame off a room. It's about 10 by 13 or 10 by 12. I can't remember exactly. Um, I had to do blow, I had to blow in insulation on the wall that faces uh, the outside. And then I insulated the other walls and the door to the fish room is not a hollow door. It's a thick door. So again, everything to try to insulate um, and keep this uh, cool or keep this warm rather in the winter time because it does get a little bit cooler here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, summertime, it gets a little warm in here, but not nearly as bad. And we don't have massive stretches of heat that, that end up being an issue. Um, so this fish room has auto water change, uh, which I've actually got the two different iterations. So the very first iteration of the auto water change was driven by this kind of manual traditional rainbird system. And maybe six months ago, I can't recall exactly when, but I put in this uh, Orbit Beehive. So that's all Bluetooth controlled. And I did mine before Corey and Dean. So, ha! <laughs> um, but no, it's pretty slick. Uh, really, really cool that I can just kick off an extra auto water change from my phone, um, connecting to this thing with Wi-Fi anywhere in the house. Really, really nice. So very convenient. Um, you know, water comes in. Uh, I've got the um, bathroom like uh, the the bathtub faucet um, temperature thing, the, the the control for temperature for what would normally be for a, um, a bathroom tub. So that's right there. So I can control the temperature of the, the hot and water, that mix. It goes into a carbon block. It then goes into a sediment filter. And then it goes into the four different uh, sprinkler systems. And then each of these racks is one of the four zones, right? So uh, yeah, that's how that system works. Um, and then it obviously plums up through PVC and gets uh, auto water changed into the tanks via just normal airline. Um, so maybe Zenzo got some B-roll of it, but there's the little on off valves. We're spooking the discus like crazy right now. They don't like it this quiet. Um, yeah, so you just kind of control it from there and each tank is identified as a tank. Uh, so E3A, I could go up there and see the E3A for the air, E3A for the water and control those if I wanted to turn those off for any given reason, uh, but they're all on right now. And do uh, you uh, heat yeah. the room or do you heat tanks? Uh, I used to actually heat the room. So I used to, in the fall, wintertime, and springtime, I would actually have an oil-filled heater here. But that was when I had more sh more 
shop lights, mm -hmm. which meant fewer lights in general, mm -hmm. right? So what I've since done is actually populate the room with a lot of 3.0s of the Fluwall 3.0, mm -hmm. and that light puts out a lot of heat, mm -hmm. okay? And then I've also started keeping more discus, so actually having heated tanks, and I found that those two combinations of things uh, plus this really large oversized dehumidifier for this room yep. right here. I think I have the exact same one in my fish room. Do you have all the krill flake all over like I uh, have No, mine's a little cleaner, <laughs> but it's exact, I probably should clean exact it. same model, I think, yeah. Yeah, and so that does, you know, those three things combined, those four things rather, the, um, combined to actually keep this room very warm or warm enough in the wintertime that I don't actually need to supplement with additional heat. So that's really nice in a small space like this. I don't have to worry about, you know, bumping my leg against the oil heater or anything like that. Um, so that's nice. And then in the uh, summertime, I usually um, turn off, uh, I try to turn off like the overhead extra lighting in here. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a bathroom fan that does exhaust as well. And that seems to do a pretty good job. And then I can always open up my door to the garage, which the garage is always like 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the house or even outside. So that does a good job of helping to bring the temperatures down as well. Um, and then I guess the last part of kind of like hardware would be the airline system. So some people might have watched the video on the Aquarium Co-op YouTube channel when we started carrying a linear piston air pump. Uh, we showed that um, basically how to run two in parallel if you have more than let's say like 40 tanks. Um, I run a lot of the ZIS filters and those tend to take more air to drive them than a normal sponge filter. So kind of a pro and con, right? Uh, but I was at a point where some of the tanks in my fish room, depending on where it was, it wasn't getting enough air to actually drive those ZIS. So Corey came over with an extra air pump. We filmed the whole process, you know, some PVC work and all that good stuff. Um, and then showed us actually putting it into the existing circular airline system that's already in place. And having that second one working in tandem was the trick. And, you know, now I've got plenty of air again, so no problem. And uh, the air will actually drive the brine shrimp hatchers, which for the sake of audio for the video, we've got pretty much everything off in the fish room that makes noise. So these will be going like crazy right now. This is what I'm gonna hatch out today. This is gonna be for tomorrow. And I actually just put this in there cause I forgot to do it last night. So uh, that is the next day's brine shrimp hatch. And then this is the fry system right here, which I'm going through kind of an overhaul cleaning right now, but all the airline drops for the uh, individual fry trays, which, you know, let's keep with the theme of, I copy Dean, but I don't do it nearly as well or as clean as him. So <laughs> my trays are very, very dirty. Uh, maybe I'll clean these before I use them again, but you know, we'll see. Good for pleco fry. Great for pleco fry, yeah. <laughs> Actually, absolutely, yeah. All right, so let's hear about some of the fish you have. All right, so, well, we wanted to start here with this rack, but before we start here, let's look at this one, because then All that right. kind of sets it up for that rack. Uh, so this 30 breeder right here, Aquarium Masters, really cool size, really like the 30 breeder and the 15. They have a shorter profile um, than like a, a 20 high or a 40 breeder but just really, really good tank. So that's that's a little bit about the aquarium. Uh, this tank has some calico and black and orange uh, leer tail mollies. And then there's also some normal ones in here, but this is just a fun tank to have, to have a, a ton of breeding going on and then always have something that I can take to the co-op, to the store and just drop off and Robert can sell and move no problem. So um, this is a really, really fun tank and periodically I will pull fish from here like smaller fry and juveniles and I'll put them in like a 10 gallon or a 15 gallon, whatever I have open. And so right now I did just do a very large, um, I don't want to say cull, cull is not the right word, but a large um, uh, move relocation or, or delivery of fish to the co-op mm -hmm. of these. So I probably had like four other tanks that were as full as this one that I took to the co-op uh, more recently. So this is one of the grow out tanks right here. Um, just a really fun fish. I think when I first got into the hobby, I didn't appreciate, you know, the mollies and, and the sword tails and platies and whatnot, but um, they're just a cool, bigger body live bear that, you know, breed fairly prolifically. Um, this tank is also fun because I've got some easy planters in here with some dwarf sash um, and a little bit of, well, quite a bit of crushed coral on the bottom, but maybe Zenzo got this on camera, but the dwarf sash has kind of come under and above the easy planter and it's just going crazy throwing runners in the, uh, in the crushed coral. So I think it just gives it a really, really fun look and, you know, I don't want to say a natural look, but there's just a ton of plant cover in here. So the fry, you know, a little fry can hide and I think they do pretty well in it. Um, what else do we have going on here? So I've got some uh, Corydora uh, Pandacoris that are growing out here. Um, those guys, those two little fish right here, and this is going to be a lesson learned for me, which I didn't think was going to be too much of an issue. But these, I believe they're Red Leopard um, uh, uh, Sailfin Mollies, these guys right here. I've been working with these for probably like 
five or six months now I've had them in this 40 breeder just giving them a lot of plant cover feeding them baby brine shrimp extreme nano all the good foods every single day um, and they just weren't really breeding for me I they finally bred right I'm in here I'm looking and I see a ton of little fry in here I get super excited and so kind of the first instinct is let's go ahead and pull them so the parents don't crush them right so I moved I don't know maybe 15 20 fry I moved them into here and the next day the bottom was just littered with mm -hmm. little fry and so you know, I pulled the young live bear fry before and moved into different tanks and not had an issue, but there was something about moving to this tank that they didn't like, and right now there's only two survivors. Um, I did miss one that's in here, so I do have a little juvenile that's growing up pretty well, so that's exciting. But these guys have been pretty, pretty stingy when it comes to breeding. When I originally ordered them from one of our wholesalers, we, uh, they sold them as pairs, and I think I got 12. But they sent 10 males and two mm. females, <laughs> even though they listed as pairs. So that's kind of a bummer. And talking to Robert, he's like, you know, they kind of do that sometimes. You know, they'll say pairs, but then they end up sending you... A pair um, of males. <laughs> they send you all males, yeah. Which, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, the males are stunning. But from a breeding perspective, not the best, right? right. Not the best mix. Um, you know, this isn't going to make the best filming, but this is just the fry system where I put these, uh, you know, fry racks. And right now, um, I, I'm just doing an overhaul on it. It was... You know, 50% of this bottom was covered in java moss. Um, you know, there were some apistos in here that I've since moved to another tank to kind of get them in closer confines. Hopefully that kicks off a little bit of breeding activity. Uh, but I just wanted to clean this up and, you know, get all the stragglers out. Because even with the fry system, those little those little trays, uh, somehow the, the a couple pleco fry will get out. Mm -hmm. And so I had just kind of like random uh, orphaned growing up plecos in there that I just needed to, to kind of get out of there and put them in actual grow out tanks so that they're easier to collect when I take them into the co-op or whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on there. Um, this is just a, this is a patience tank right here. Patience meaning, you know, patience is a virtue. If you, if you want to do fish breeding, have, a, have your fish room or have certain projects, you need to be patient with the fish. And so these are two discus red melons that to the best of my knowledge are a pair. I have not had them lay yet, so maybe they're not male, female, but nonetheless, uh, I'm going to be patient with them and just give them time, give them space, give them good food, and hopefully um, they will spawn in return. So, so this 20 long up here, this is actually the um, pygmy sunfish tank that when Bob and I were going to do our pygmy sunfish breed off, um, this was going to be the home for my pygmy sunfish. Uh, right now you can actually see a couple of them in there, which they're usually pretty skittish. So that's kind of cool to see them out right now. I've got water lettuce in there and it's really fun to see them uh, basically parked up underneath the water lettuce, like what they kind of would do in the actual wild. Um, so about three quarters of the pygmy sunfish in here, I recently got from our collecting trip in Florida, or my collecting trip in Florida with Ryan from Wild Fish Tanks. Uh, shout out, buddy. Um, so yeah, he um, we went out and caught some, and then he caught even more, and then shipped them to me recently, and they all did everything that he shipped me survived, so that's awesome. Um, so yeah, super cool fish there. Uh, this tank's got some hiding yellow labs. I don't do much with African cichlids, but I did, um, I've got a couple tanks right now with them just to, just to kind of have them and play with them. And to take a step back, I would say that when I built this fish room, I was doing it more for BAP points. So breeders mm -hmm. award programs for my fish club. So breeding more uh, of different fish species to get those points to have a higher elevation. And then one day, Ah, I'll be with my hero Dean, right? I'll be a master breeder, right? So um, that was originally kind of my intent. And then I went down like the angelfish discus rabbit hole where most of my tanks were going to be for growing those guys out. And at one point I did have a lot of angelfish growing out. Um, haven't had as much success with the discus. Uh, and then from there, it's kind of gone back to like more of a BAP fish room. So I have more species, more breeding activity, and just kind of like having a more well-rounded experience, I think, as opposed to going super hard in the paint with like just discus or just angelfish, something like that. But um, as we'll see in this rack, I still definitely do have beautiful blue diamonds. They will lay periodically, but they'll eat their eggs about a, about a day after or shortly there after laying them. I've got two tanks of angelfish breeders. So one over there, one over here. Uh, they're past like four or five different clutches of eggs. Like they've, they just haven't been fertilized. So they've been turning white within like a day or so. Um, I've been using methylene blue, kind of the exact same method as all before of having a lot of success with angelfish. So not sure what's going on there, why the eggs aren't getting fertilized, but you know, again, keep working with them and you know, they'll eventually get it figured out. Um, moving down here. So because I work for the co-op, because I have access to them, I have to have the Vienna guppies. So I brought home like four pairs and they've since just kicked off and had 
you know, a ton of fry. So this will be fun to just, you know, play with these guys for a few months, keep taking them into the co-op so we've got more of that awesome fish going in there. Um, and then, you know, maybe have a pair and put them in like my son's tank or something upstairs. But um, this is this is one that I just couldn't pass up on on not actually having them. Uh, these two, two these two tanks are Corridoras that again, a patience project. This is the Venezuelanus Cori, and this is the Corridora Equis. And you know, haven't quite figured it out with them. I've tried, you know, tannins and black water mixtures and catapa leaves and low flow air for the sponge filter, high flow, just all the different kinds of things, uh, pumping in cold water, trying to trying to get some type of breeding activity out of them. I thought a couple weeks ago there was a crazy amount of activity. Normally these guys are super lazy. They just hang out on the bottom and they're probably like the laziest Corridora out there, at least in my experience. And they were just going nuts. And I really, really thought I was gonna get some egg activity or some, some breeding activity, but you know, alas, um, nothing, nothing in there. So, oh well, they're still a super cool Cory and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll keep them until, until something happens. So I think, and then over here, this is some Chilorthina fasciata growing out. These are rainbow fish. Um, the original juveniles that I got were from Gary Lang. And this is just a really cool kind of, you know, longer rainbow, a little bit more sardini, but beautiful purple, silver, bluish iridescence. Really, really cool fish. The parents are down here in this tank, which I need to put them in a little bit of a larger tank. I actually might move them back from this 10 gallon back to that 20 high over there, make it species specific. Um, and do the whole you know spawning moth and always have maybe like a tank growing out of those guys because I think that's a really cool fish um, and I believe they should be a care species they should be endangered in the wild um, should not that it's something that I want but I believe that that to be a true statement this rack over here a um, couple of let's see here what do we got going on here so um, shout out to Jeanne, right? So mm -hmm. Jeanne, these are her better rubras that she sent me uh, when when I did the interview with her we talked about better rubras. And this is a paternal mouth brooding betta. So that means the, the male is the one that actually holds the eggs. And she sent me a trio. So it'd be, for these guys, it'd be a reverse trio. So two males, one female. And you want the two males so that uh, they can kind of take turns holding the eggs and one male isn't being exhausted. Um, and I've actually got kind of two different methods, right? So this is their main tank, heavily planted, java moss on the bottom, dwarf sag. Um, I recently put in some um, hygrophilia in there and like ton of breeding activity, a couple generations of fry, like we can see the different sizes. And that's gonna be from just leaving a male in there that was holding, but there's enough cover in there and they don't prey, I guess, too much on their young that obviously I was able to have success. I did pull a male once and I put him here in this tank and I saw one little fry, you know, a couple days after, or maybe three or four days after I put him in there and then I didn't see any more fry activity. And then my assumption was that the male just maybe, he just crushed them, right? He didn't take care of the eggs or he crushed the fry. Um, but uh, I moved the male back into this tank. And then a few days later, like I started noticing just all the fry. So there's probably like 20 fry of better rubra in this tank as well. So I thought he did do, do a good job, but he actually did. So this one's uh, populated with better rubra as well. And that's really cool. Um, you know, kind of a, the common running thing with my fish room is always having the super reds breeding, the super red plecos. So this is a tank of super reds right here. Probably, I don't know, was it like 50 fry? You know, 50 little small fry juvenile super reds in there. And again, that's another fish that I love to be able to provide the co-op that, uh, especially during the pandemic when fish supplies from our wholesalers was just non-existent. Like anything that we could bring in that was different than what was available was great to be able to offer our customers. And so, you know, that's, that's really, personally for me, I like that. I, I like the satisfaction of knowing that, you know, people are going to want a fish that I'm breeding, even if they don't know it's me, that's totally fine. But, you know, doing my little part to, to help the retail store out when I'm so operations and warehouse and vendor management focused. Um, this is another kind of African, you know, well, this is an African cichlid, but this is one that, again, I've never kept before. This is going to be multifasciatus, uh, the, the, the smaller multi-shell dweller. What's the... Neolapologus multifasciatus. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Senzo. So I've never kept these guys before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, Ryan had a contact in Florida who they were working with them. And so he went ahead and picked some up and sent them with my shipment of top minnows. And, um, you could have told me because I have like way too many Do of you? them. Yeah. <laughs> nice. 
So I got mine all the way from Florida, yeah, and yeah. they're super healthy. They're doing great. And, every, and initially, when I had the, you know, I put crushed coral in. It was nice mm -hmm. and level. Um, instead of using the shells, I wanted an easier time when they breed to actually be able to extract the, the fry. Mm -hmm. And apparently, when you do the actual snail shells, it's almost impossible to mm -hmm. get them out. Um, so with the PVC, uh, you basically just make it so that you can take one end of the PVC off, and then there you go. You've got yeah. access to the uh, to the fry. And I'm sure Zenzo probably got some footage of that. But I had this nice flat layer of coral. And I knew they liked to rearrange. I didn't <laughs> think they were going to be able to pick up the PVC because obviously that's way heavier than a snail shell. Mm -hmm. But they have moved the coral around like crazy. Yep. I did. I thought maybe they'd move sand. But the fact that these little fish are moving chunks of coral is hilarious. And I think that's such a cool little personality. They've got these awesome little blue eyes. They've got little yellow trim on their top fins. So I'm, I'm actually I'm really enjoying this fish right now. Wait till you see the uh, gold oscillatus that I gave Dean. I think I think uh, Ryan actually had some of those. They're awesome. Yeah, so I just gave Dean some because um, I have a bunch uh, breeding, so he'll be uh, spotting those and nice. you'll have to get your hands on those ones. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But these are these are really cool. I mean, there's so much personality in the African cichlids, and I'm not saying I'm gonna go you know full riff lake kind of crazy guy in here, <laughs> but I think having a splash of it here and there, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of breaks things up a little bit, and and uh, you know just. Again, makes it more well-rounded, right? Like, you know, not ever keeping something from a, a, a particular part of the world. I just, I don't know, like, it, I like it. I mm -hmm. like being able to keep something from everywhere. And this bottom one right here, so this is gonna be Geophagus Pellegrini, really beautiful kind of red-humped Geophagus, ultra skittish. I don't know what they do to the plants and the rock wool, but they make an absolute mess. Like, there's no substrate in there, but they clearly get in there and they, they, they move some stuff around. Um, I've had a couple spawns from them. One was actually super successful and I was able to pull the fry. Zenzo, maybe you got some B-roll of these guys, but mm -hmm. that's, you know, however many Geophagus Pellegrini fry I've been growing out. And that was about a two and a half year wait, right? So these guys were originally in the 210 gallon that was against this wall. I've had these guys for about two and a half years and just maybe four or five months ago had a successful spawn from them. So it's just purely give them good water, give them somewhere where they're gonna feel comfortable, feed them well, and they produce, right? And so that was that was really cool to be able to, um, you know, I can't say that I did anything magical to make that happen, but, you know, just having the patience again, that's the theme. That, that have, have a thumbnail, like this is just gonna be like a rainbow, like a <laughs> rainbow between my hands and it's gonna say patience. Um, yeah, so patience paid off with that one. That's really cool. And I didn't notice actually, so a newer project is um, albino quarries. So allegedly a super easy quarry. In this particular setup, they haven't bred yet. I haven't really tried to do anything to get them to spawn. But uh, when Zenzo pulled this light forward to take some B-roll, like it just lit them up so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually really captivated <clears throat> right now that they look that cool. Like they're looking really, really good right now. Um, so that's another project. These are... Oh man, I don't even know what these epistogrammas are right now. These are the Fire Red Agazizii. I think those are Fire Red Agazizii. It's been a while since I brought those in, about maybe six months ago. They were in the 40 breeder with all the other Plecos. And I kind of think that that was maybe a little bit too large for them. So the group is now in this smaller 15 where I have successfully bred Epistos before. I bred the wild ones I brought back from Peru in 2019. So I know from a footprint size that at least Epistos will breed in this footprint. So hopefully the smaller confines will keep them a little bit closer together. Maybe they'll get more territorial. Maybe that will jumpstart some breeding activity because I didn't get any in the 40 breeder. Um, and then also I think having some super reds in there, they were kind of chasing them off. So maybe just having a straight species specific tank will be what they need. All right, last rack folks. So let's point out how cool this pothos is. Super so cool. This, so this pothos has grown out of the, uh, um, the Peru discus tank. And, you know, it was just kind of like, the pothos is everywhere in my fish room, and more, more often than not, I'll clip it so it doesn't get long. Um, but this one, like, it was just kind of scraggly back here, but it was coming out, and I said, let's take some command hooks and actually just string it along, right? And so hopefully the goal is, I just, and, and, and I'm not the originator of this, I know other people have done this. I've worked somewhere where they had pothos all over the cubicles, and it was really cool. But I want to get that effect where it kind of looks a little jungly in here and just have mm -hmm. pothos everywhere. I think that would be pretty neat. Um, and actually scrolling through Instagram, I was telling Corey and Zenzo this, that Command now actually advertises Pothos specific little hangers. It was crazy. So yeah, they must be, uh, they must be spying on me. So yeah, that's cool. This tank up here, 
Uh, this is going to be probably 20 super red long fins um, that of, of various ages and sizes, but I'm really trying to, to ramp up on the super red long fin production. And if anybody had heard my conversation with Ryan from Wild Fish Tanks about his struggles with the long fin variant as well as mine, there's just something about the long fins where they don't breed as prolifically as an albino or a super red or a normal bristle nose. So hopefully just having more bodies in there will do the trick. Um, and then now I've more recently, when I broke down that 20 breeder, or I'm sorry, 20, I just made up a size, uh, that 20 high, it had Praycox rainbows, these guys. So now I've gone species specific with the rainbows in here. So hopefully I get that dither fish effect and maybe that's what the super red long fins need is just that dither fish comfort. Um, and you know, the very next morning of putting the spawning mop in here of moving these guys, you know, that, that mop is littered with eggs right now. So I'll probably do like a weekly cycle where I put a spawning mop in and when it, after a week goes, I'll put it in an empty 10 gallon and just grow out rainbow fish because that is a fish that Robert um, did ask, you know, if, if I could work with them and, and bring some quantity into the store, mm -hmm. you know, they would, they, they do very well for us and it's a great, beautiful fish. Um, so yeah, the only, the only thing that, the, that's a bummer about them is that rainbow fish in general, they do just grow so slow, very, very slow growing fish. Uh, we already talked about the Leertail tank. Uh, we talked about the uh, Red Leopard sailfin tank, which super cool. I mean, when that boy throws up his sailfin, mm -hmm. that's so awesome. Um, I bumped up the intensity on the light, and true to what they do, the discus did not like it, and they have been skittish and super dark ever since. So not a whole lot going on there with the discus. Um, Corridora barbatus. So this is the one where, again, if you follow me and kind of you know what I post. They, it was a group of 12 that I split into two different tanks, uh, two different 20 highs, just to see if gravel or any other conditions made a difference in breeding. Um, in those two setups, I had no breeding activity. I since moved them into their own 40 breeder, and they breed maybe once every week to a week and a half, they'll spawn. Um, however, I have not had any success when I actually pulled the eggs. So I don't know if snails are getting to them, if the pleco that's in there as well is getting to them and kind of messing up the shell. Um, but the next thing I'm going to do is just do straight out of the tank because I was using a breeder box in the in the actual tank to, to house them. Um, I'm going to put them in a specimen container or uh, you know whatever container I'm going to use. Do methylene blue very much like what I do with angelfish eggs. So I'm going to try that next. If that doesn't work, I'll try hydrogen peroxide. Um, but no, just again patience and just keeping and keeping with a fish, experimenting because um, I know Corey wants me to actually breed these and give them some. So. He actually might try to steal him. He is, he is here. I got to keep an eye on him. And then, yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be about it, my man. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the tour with Randy. Thank you very much for showing us around. We know we've talked a lot about your fish room. I wanted to see it, so finally got a chance. And uh, Randy is on social media. He is at the Aquarius Podcast. So where can they find you? Uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Aquarius Podcast. Um, I do have a, a YouTube channel where the interviews go as well That for the Aquarius Podcast. I'll do maybe a, a, a video update once every six months. So I'm not the best on that. Um, and then also on the Aquarium Co-op Forum. So just my name, Randy. I post on there. I try to frequently. Um, I need to get better about that because yeah. it's a really fun forum, but I'm also on there as well. Awesome. Great. Well, I'll put some links down below where you can uh, check out the podcast. The podcasts are super inter uh, interesting to hear the interviews that he has with uh, various fish experts from around the world. Great thing to listen to while you're doing water changes or maintenance on your aquariums. So I'll put some links down below. And you can see yourself. We're all good. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I might. <laughs>